osteoarthritis is where you get joint wear um, that can go down to the point of bone on bone rubbing um, normally sort of starts um, out in the hands and the feet the toes and the fingers and then works its way into the body uh, if we presume that this is something to do with uh, mechanics then obviously it will be a whole whole body mechanic you're looking at or a mechanic around that joint and, and getting the rest of the body to move around that joint uh, the reality is it could be a lot more things and you might not want to get too involved in that um, and it could be nutritional or hydration or something similar or just they're more prone to a, an arthritis and the things you can do for this client is to help them build strength in their joints in motions that are useful for them for everyday life and so um, some of the things that you can do in terms of helping directly is just build strength without pain some of the things you can help them do which is an indirect approach um, this might be things sort of as balance training so they don't go into positions where they can directly impact the area that's also affected um, maybe as well as as the arthritis gets worse you can help them work through functional movements to try and help them find different ways of of creating success in their tasks and so uh, lifting might be from the forearms not from the hands that kind of thing but you're just teaching them other ways of making motions and creating those successes uh, so you take the the need to go into pain or put pressure through the joints you're taking that away for them in a lot of situations spondylolisthesis is something that's debated as whether it it's a something or not and so we wouldn't be the ones that are diagnosing this we might not agree that you know it's something that exists or doesn't um, and we might agree that it exists but it has no reflection on pain um, and that's something that I'd leave the therapist to debate however if someone comes in with spondylolisthesis then the diagnosis would have come from someone who obviously um, believes that that can cause pain and so you have to go with that and they'll have believed that there's a forward slippage of one of the vertebra um, which is most common in the lower back so this is something that's been associated with hyperextension of the spine and so this might be something that you want to look at and say well what motions then are going to be associated with this causing a problem and what will the the client want to to work on and with and so as this happens kind of around the lumbar and the, the SI joint as it happens in that area then you may want to think about well, what would cause a, a hyperextension at the lumbar? Um, and can I work on the mechanics around that, presuming that this is correct and, and that's my role? And so then you might be looking at, can I get the hips into a place um, where it protects the, the lumbar from extension? So a good thing to do is to be in a split stance where one leg is raised in front of you. Um, and that way you take out the, the extension you take out the neutral position of the lumbar whatever their neutral is and you put it in a more flex position then you can drive extension with a type 1 or type 2 mo movement in the thoracic so where type 1 is a, is a lateral flexion one way and a rotation the other um, so for example right lateral flexion left rotation or left lateral flexion right rotation or you can drive sort of a type 2 motion in that thoracic which would be where the, the rotation and the lateral flexion are the same. So a right lateral flexion, right rotation, or a left lateral flexion, left rotation. But essentially you can drive a mobility in the thoracic while protecting the lumbar. Then the opposite side to that is looking at what, what motions across the hip would be missing that would require more extension from the spine. Um, and that's quite often a hip extension. And so you, you may want to look at ways where you can get into hip extension, but you're driving distal faster than proximal and allowing the arms and shoulders to come with you a little in order to take that pressure off the lumbar while still getting into their hips. Um, by getting that motion, 
probably working through the, the big eight motions of the hip um, or, or the big four with extension while you're working with the other four with flexion on the opposite leg. That would give you a good opportunity to get that extension through the um, hip to protect the lumbar. Again, if you do this traveling forward and up, then you'll tip the pelvis into a posterior position will get an extension on the rear leg and that will allow the, the lumbar to feel more flexion than extension while you do this. And the, those two stretches together could be a good way of, of easing the amount of times you need extension at the lumbar, which in this scenario is, is the thought process behind the cause of the thing they call spondylolisthesis. Um, and like I say, then you don't have to get in the debate of what it is or why it is. You can just get in the debate of can I take the pressure away from the lumbar by never working on the lumbar and allowing the therapist to, to have that um, space to, to, to work their sort of magic. Whiplash is caused by a sort of a, a violent acceleration, deceleration. And um, with a regular client, you'll probably see that this happens with sort of like it's a car crash or something similar to that that would have caused it. Although I've seen people get it for as little as sneezing. I've had clients who get it playing professional sport. Um, so the the thing with whiplash is it's not it's it's a diagnosis of soft tissue injury. Um, and so really it's not your place to be training it. It's up in the um, cervical or cervical spine. And so it's really not a, a place that you're going to massively affect through conditioning directly but indirectly you could help and so this is something where helping them to stay mobile around their hips and thoracic while allowing them to use their eyes to to drive them in places that keeps their um, cervical or cervical spine in positions where they don't feel pain that might be your best solution while the the therapist that's working with them works on a plan of getting them away from pain because of the condition Uh, a fractured clavicle is something that, that happens immediately um, and so it's something that you're going to need to work around. Um, you need to have a look at, at how they've been treated for this but normally it's their arms in a sling and so you have to work out the consequences of well, what does that mean the thoracic spine is not going to feel so much of? What does that mean the hips are not going to feel so much of? What does that mean the foot and ankle aren't going to feel so much of? And that would be where, where you're looking when you're looking at, at how you can help this person through their recovery period. Um, and you might think things such as shoulder mobility uh, might be tough to work on, but things such as thoracic mobility might then impact shoulder mobility. So if it's a right side injury, you might use the left side to drive motions and so give you all the motions in the thoracic you need to allow the shoulder to be able to move through ranges that you want it to re to move through. Um, this is definitely one where you're not trying to treat anything, but as with anything, if you're a personal trainer or a, or a strength conditioning coach, you're not trying to treat anything anyway. You just want to lessen the impact on performance that this injury causes. Uh, dislocated shoulder this is one of the uh, the alternatives of the dislocated shoulder um, but again it's something that you've got to think about and say well what what can I actually do and and all you can actually do is work with the client after they've been treated and so your goal is going to be to increase a, a range in the shoulder within the parameters allowed by the therapist when appropriate but also it's going to be your responsibility to make sure that that this injury is not affecting them through the thoracic and the hips and the foot and ankle. And so in a shoulder dislocation, um, what, what can occur is that um, when the shoulder gets into an abduction and an external rotation, then um, that's when it's, it's in a, a, its most vulnerable position. And so if you think about that, that usually happens when the arm's traveling backwards. So if it was a right arm, it would be traveling backwards and up. And so the associated motion with the thoracic that you'd want 
would be a right rotation with a left lateral flexion if it was right side, uh, which is a type 1 motion. Now that type 1 motion um, will come to an abrupt stop if you're lacking internal rotation on the same side hip, so right side hip, or external on the opposite hip. And that could also link down to the inability to keep the right foot on the floor um, as it goes into a, a supinated position, um, into an inversion, or get the left foot down to the floor and get it into a sort of a pronated position or a loaded position. And that, and that's that's kind of important for us when we look at this because um, if we can get the whole rest of the chain to be able to handle abduction and external rotation at all different ranges, driven by the opposite arm, then we're going to reduce the chances of the body getting into a position that will pop that shoulder. Um, and that could be the best thing we do for this client so that they can return to function and, and they can start to, to gain some confidence in that shoulder once it starts to come through recovery and the therapist has signed them off. A shoulder impingement is similar from our perspective. It's something that, that occurs over time. Um, it could be from like inflammation of the tissue around that area. But the point is, if you get if you're doing something overhead, it's quite often that then the hit and end range in that joint will start to cause the problem. If it if it is a mechanical problem, which which as I say across all the injuries, we are presuming that mechanics causes the issue but we don't want to rule out anything else and and that's why we have a therapist to to deal with all that for us but if it is a mechanical condition then you're going to think well this is sort of overhead movements so the ability to be able to extend through the thoracic with either a type 1 or type 2 motion um and the ability to be able to internally and externally rotate through the hips while extending through the hips the ability to be able to dorsiflex and plantar flex while um, pronating or supinating through the feet are all things that will come together that will, if they're missing, will impact that shoulder. And so the shoulder will take the brunt of the problems. So the shoulder, shoulder will get hammered repeatedly. Um, and that could be the reason that we end up with sort of um, tissue in that area being swollen. And again, it, it's not really your problem other than you've got to look at what's happening and say, well, what's my role in this? And let the therapist have their role. So um, tennis elbow and any kind of elbow injury or, or problem is, again, it comes down to repetitiveness, potentially if it's a mechanical thing. And so your goal has got to be to look across the chain and at the mechanics of the body and say what way can I give the client back the ranges and strength in ranges and strength in end ranges and the skills to use these ranges when they're performing the thing that causes the repetitive injury how can I help them there it's quite a good idea to say well what what's the thing that causes you most problem with this this injury and then draw up a, a HMAC or draw up an idea of the movement at each joint and then go to each joint and start to work there to try and help with that um, that motion or those motions. Um, and so that will help you to gain strength and range in the rest of the body while the therapist is working on the treatment of, of this injury. Elbow instability could be a similar sort of thing um, where you're looking at the rest of the body you can see in this movement we put on here look how sort of how much sort of rotation and, and extension is required in there um, through the torso through the thoracic in order to be able to make this move possible if you imagine any of those things not happening then you're going to get that impact in that elbow and and that could be causing a problem if it's an um an instability in the elbow just because they're that's just their thing, that's just what happens to them, then you've got to be hypersensitive to the rest of the body being able to move to allow that person to be able to, to use the ranges in their elbow without a negative consequence. Um, you may also want to work on conditioning exercises that, that slow down motions at the elbow 
in all different ranges so that so that the client never really gets to that point where they feel pain and again that's presuming that this is all mechanical